I will introduce myself as I do. I am Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my 33rd of 36 lectures. Today's lecture is called Free Passage. I put the emphasis there from being tightly coupled to the surface of groups. Now, first we'll start with Gogol's story of the nose, which is a story of being tightly coupled to power. I, I had been reading this 24-page story, and I was feeling the more I read, the more lighthearted I got. I thought, oh, this is interesting. And Gogol was freeing me up, so I needed to think about how we all might get some free passage from this. The story has two minor characters. One is Ivan Yak Yakulevich, a barber. The second is Kovalev, a bureaucrat who is one of the barber's clients. The third and only major character is Kovalev's nose, which you'll see, which we come to presently. The plot is eating, the, Ivan the barber was eating breakfast one day and um, he cut into his bread only to find a nose in his bread. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. And precisely the nose of Kovalev, his client. Ivan is terrified that he had cut, off, cut it off barbering Kovalev while drunk, which he often was. <laughs> That's sort of a surgeon's nightmare, huh? <laughs> and is about to be arrested at any moment by the police. All his attempts to divest himself of the nose, he tries to drop it into the Neva River off the bridge and someone comes, the policeman sees him do it and brings it back to him. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Gogol takes us to the waking up of Kovalev, minus his nose. <laughs> Needless to say, he too is terrified. <laughs> Like Ivan, you can see where Kafka got his stories, like you know, waking up as a beetle or something. Uh, Kovalev goes running to the chief of police into a pastry shop to look in the mirror, all in vain. No nose. Then the inexplicable jumps to another level. Suddenly he stopped. This is quoting the story. Suddenly he stopped, as if rooted outside the doors of one house. Before his eyes, an inexplicable phenomenon occurred. A carriage stopped in the entrance. The door opened. A gentleman in a uniform jumped out, hunching over, and ran up the stairs. What was Kovalev's horror as well as amazement when he recognized him as his own nose? How was it possible, indeed, that the nose which was yesterday on his face, unable to drive or walk, needless to say, should be in a uniform. End of quote. I will leave you to the delight of the unfolding of the plot. How is this possible? It comes to stand for all the fronts of Russia, running after their ambitions based on nothing, save having a nose that gravitates towards power. You've never seen a person like this, have you? <laughs> Could it be so now? I ask you to answer that question yourself by looking around. I will help you look around by telling you two dreams of my own that give quite a look around. Now for the first dream. This is called the author's dream of two titanium shafts. And I still have my watch on, which is a terrible and tragic mistake. I dreamt last night that I was riding a motor scooter going five miles an hour down the sidewalk. <laughs> so I, that was a sort of indication I should go slowly today. <laughs> I'll tell you what tragedy occurred on the sidewalk later. Um, all right. Um, don't go to the whiteboard quite yet. Here's the, here's the text. This is the whole text of the dream. Visiting another department, 
I enter its large group meeting with a tiny wrench. No, it would be in my left hand, sorry. To tighten the nuts that, so to speak, <laughs> that fit these two beautiful spokes like those of a bicycle, but made of infinitely stronger material like titanium to the surface of the discussion. Now we can go to the whiteboard and you'll see the, 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 uh, the forces. You see those long shafts, uh, those are the titanium uh, shafts, and, and you see how they're, they're I, with my wrench, with, with my little wrench, I, I've tightened those to the surface of the discussion. You see those points one and two where the discussion always goes from one known thing to another known thing, like antidepressants are coupled to antidepressants. And, and um, I'll come back to what three and four are. Those are the unknown unknowns that I'm, I'm about to explain to you what I, how I bring the unknown unknowns onto the field. The tight, you can come back and look this way, you get the picture. The tight coupling of the group to its surface is always reflected in obvious jokes, always getting uniform consent of smiles and nods, obvious recommendations to the presenter, and reassurance that everything was for the best. You been at that meeting? I decide finally what to say about the whole situation of the patient by keeping myself apart from these verbal and nonverbal assurances to one another that we are all of the same mind. God damn it, we are not all of the same mind, so to speak. Sorry, Pam. I find myself with the feel, I always then, having uncut, loosely coupled myself to people that are tightly coupled to the surface, I find myself with what? With the feelings and thoughts of the patient that are not wanted, like rage and despair. Now, we, if you're not back from the whiteboard, I guess you did. I'll finish up this part. Now, loose coupling to the group surface leaves me everything I need. Now it is simply a matter of putting it in as a single detail or two. Say, the violent act of the patient who was supposed to be so nice. You ever heard of that, man? Thus, the dream depicts my tightening the nuts <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> that fasten the titanium spokes from below, basically from my gut, to the surface of the discussion, my head. Another way of describing this dream in his diagram is this. The sieve, or net, as Poincaré would say, is mapping its own action. An instrument or of orientation that stays free of tight coupling to the surface and stays immersed in its own loose coupling, made for it unconsciously by its action as a sieve. Just as Poincaré found sufficient for arriving at his original proofs of nonlinear geometry, which founded that very field. He would have millions of possibilities to, to establish the proof, and he, in his, his net out of the night sea, would select the one, the right one. I'm saying we all can do that. We can do it in meetings. We can use this beautiful net that will select what everyone wants to leave out. All right. Now this dream is called author's dream of God, in quotation marks, as the sovereign of all serial groups. This, this dream is dedicated to Pam. Let me first tell you what a serial group means. Sartre defined it as a group that is a series, like a series of citizens getting on a bus. They only have in common, they are riding a common vehicle like a bus. They have no individuality whatsoever. Just, I couldn't even pronounce individuality, I said it so fast. Just being number one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Almost the entire surface of society is riding common vehicles that are programs from going from place one to two, like Madison to San Diego. Okay? Or, in, in our profession, our, our vehicles of our profession are simply from getting to any known problem like depression to its known solution in antidepressive drug or program. That's a vehicle. It's a bus. Anyone can ride it, numbers one through five to five million. Last evening, I fell on the verge of getting free of, of our serial group here, this one I belong to, and all of its buses. 
And, um, but I, I, was, I realized it was hopeless because every time I get away from it, like what I'm doing right now, um, or in my unconventional practice, which I explained last week, you know, like uh, in a conventional med check, finding out what's the whole story of the patient's life, or in a longer session, um, you know, a dream, getting a dream that will show the, the whole history. Um, these things always snap back like a rubber fence. People snap back out of this, out of this anti-convention, back to convention. To being loyal members of the, of the group running its procedures, its machines. You know, psychiatry is a collection of bus drivers. That's an insult to bus drivers. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> that. They will. You can absolutely count on it. Like Gogol could count on it. See how I'm scratching my nose? See how they, you can absolutely count on it. Like Gogol could count on the noses rushing everywhere in Russia to run its surface or territories. Just go down to the West Transfer thing, and you'll see noses rush, rushing off in all directions. All right, let's look at the... Uh, diagram on the right over there. So um, the, um, the first, at 4.30 in the morning, I, I dream I need to put a screened in window in the back of my car. Curious, I thought, you know, I was, I'm going to have to cut a hole in the back of my, back of my car so there's a screened in window. And I thought, interesting. You know? and then about 6.30 in the morning, I dreamt Ruth and I were back in Burgundy like last fall for a month, and I'm cutting a hole in the metal in the back of my car, uh, into, and I'm going to put a wind, you know, I'm cutting a frame for it, and I'm going to put a, a door this time in the back of my car, which I hope to get from Home Depot. <laughs> Perhaps it will be an exit for me and my dog. <laughs> I talked with God about it. I actually did. And he, has, he said he hadn't gotten my order for the standard window, nor has he even seen my order yet, but he, because he's been too busy. But he assures me I have one of the next priorities. Let's come back from the whiteboard here. At 7.30 in the morning, I laugh to my, see anyone can imitate and pretend to be God, especially, especially people that are, run things like Home Depot. Is this Home Depot story here or what? <laughs> At 7.30 in the morning, I laughed to myself at the proof, which might have amused Poincaré as another remarkable example of nonlinear geometry. The rubber fence, in other words, not every, every morning at 4, I'm going to give my next lecture on this, it's such an important topic. Everything that's important is a matter of nonlinear geometry. Two positions that are totally different, but seem very close together. In this case, the rubber fence of the surface, and, and the capture of the sac and the sacred. Once you collapse the sacred in, into the surface, you get God as 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 a, as the sovereign of Home Depot, filling orders. It's of course it's the travesty of religion. No less a demonstration than this would suffice for what I've been up against. All right, this is called the case. The last section is called the case of every person. It includes you, Stuart, and me, all of us. Is that a large claim? Mildly. So, but I think you'll find that this is true of you too, if you think about it. I think we all have to struggle against the surface. I mean, we're group animals. We're made to, to, to bob and nod our heads when a group is talking about something. To run against it takes a, a remarkable power. Which you can give yourself. You can give yourself free passage, but you've got to know how to do it. So, to conclude, I give you the case of every person. Every person is tightly coupled to his or her group. The tight coupling means that whatever the group thinks, he or she cannot help thinking it him or herself. This leads every person to be heavy-hearted, weighed down with a point of view that makes him or her unable to hold on to his or her own thoughts. I will give you one of countless examples. All of our patients have this problem. All of our doctors have this problem. And you can supply all, 
um, millions of other ones, just anywhere. Suppose the patient was conceiving of a wedding with his spouse to be that excluded bringing children. Suppose he and she sent out such an invitation. Suppose also that one couple of the hundred guests brought their young children fairly out of control who began to disrupt the situation, precisely why they gave the invitation that they gave. Suppose that he and his wife-to-be remind this couple of the conditions of the invitation and ask them to take the disruptive children elsewhere. Suppose, finally, that many of the guests sympathized with the parents of the disruptive young children and became angry with the wedding couple. What will happen to every person, our patient? He is apt to be taken captive by the point of view of this cohort of angry guests. Thus, he feels terrible and shows Gustafson's sign of guilt, pointing at his own head. Now he's ready to shoot himself in the head for being a mean person. Maybe two fingers, maybe three fingers of self-accusation. He has been feeling so heavily weighed down ever since when I saw him last week. Having taken the anger of this group of guests as his own point of view. Losing his original point of view or line of sight that conceived of a wedding free of disruption. I say to him, hunched forward in great tension in front of me. That's him, not me. I say, would you mind sitting back on the couch for a minute? I said to him. He sits back. I ask him how he feels now. Takes a deep breath, right? He's able to breathe. Yeah. 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 The resident asks him if he is not considered that all but two of the hundred guests actually obey the invitation. How is it that he lets one willful couple take over his, own, his whole mind? Now he relaxes in the second line of sight, sitting back from the surface, right? And comes back to the rightness of what he and his wife-to-be had conceived of to start with. Now he feels re relieved and lighthearted. Like my dog and myself going out the back door of my car, he has gotten a free passage from being coupled to the surface of the group. His nose for the group had run away with him, and now he was no longer its prisoner. Thank you. <laughs>